Hi and welcome to The Print. My name is Karanjeet Kaur and I'm a journalist and an editor. Today I'd like to read you some excerpts from my column on Rahul Gandhi and his remarks on unpaid labor done by women. It isn't every day that a Rahul Gandhi speech goes down without controversy. In a recent video from a rally in Amravati in Maharashtra, the Congress MP and the star campaigner for his party made some pointed and irrefutable remarks about the unpaid work women do at home. Every woman in this country works outside the home for 8 to 10 hours, followed by an 8-hour shift at home, Gandhi said. He listed cooking, childcare and elderly care as responsibilities that naturally fall to women and have never been accounted for. Gandhi went on to say, Men will not like what I've said, but this is the reality of India. In the same speech, Gandhi promised that when it comes to power, the India Alliance would deposit 1 lakh rupees annually in the bank accounts of women from poor households. Gandhi's address was received warmly, at least on Twitter, YouTube and Reddit comments. Predictably, Mainstream news channels that otherwise cannot stop talking about the PM's Nari Shakti or women empowerment policies fail to pick it up. No counter shots have been fired by other parties either. In a period defined by Mangal Sutra politics, I truly admire Gandhi's progressiveness. But he is far from the first political leader to train a spotlight on women's unpaid labor. Every election season, India's women are witness to a parade of such promising initiatives. In 2020, Kamal Hassan's Makkal Nidhi Mayam Party's manifesto promised homemakers value rights assistance amounting to 3,000 rupees. Several other parties, including the DMK, the Congress, AIA DMK, and Trinamool Congress, have discussed direct transfer schemes to women. None of these arguments are new either. These are ideas that have been around at least since the pre-independence era. In 1946, the All India Women's Conference presented the draft of the Indian Women's Charter of Rights and Duties at the United Nations. It's a beautifully progressive document, full of hope, and it sounds like it could have been written yesterday. Article 8 of the Charter holds, and I quote, the work of the housewife has so far received no recognition in the sense that no steps have been taken or thought for the protection of one who works from morning till night without rest or leave or holiday. The document states that raising the status, mental and physical health, and crucially, the leisure time of homemakers and the mothers of the race is essential. The draft suggestions include that women who work at home have a right to a part of their husband's income and that they must be included in the government's social insurance schemes aimed at workers and also that creches, infant classes and pre-basic schools should be provided by the government or municipalities. My heart broke a little while reading this charter. Almost 80 years have passed since it was first written and these are issues that women still grapple with. While many of these stated goals have made their way into law, so many are yet to be fully achieved. Still, by focusing on the invisible labour of women, Gandhi has endeared himself to the urbane woman voter as much as the rural one. Regardless of class and social status, the bulk of care work is disproportionately the responsibility of women. Every single report and study comes to the same conclusion. According to the first National Time Use Survey conducted in India in 2020 by the National Statistical Office, 81.2% of women engaged in unpaid domestic services. The comparative figure for men is only 26.1%. Men put in 3.6 hours on domestic chores as compared to women who put in 34.6 hours more than 10 times that of men. Maybe a better way to understand unpaid and undervalued work is to actually put a value on it. As a UN report tells us, 
the total value of time spent on unpaid care and domestic work by women in India is equivalent to 39% of the GDP. In other words, unpaid work makes the world go around and women across the globe are enablers of any economic activity. And yet, we rarely hold women's work in high regard. We draw distinctions between skilled and unskilled labor and classify cooking, cleaning, laundry, plus the mental labor that goes into planning all of these as unskilled. Even though we know the back-breaking effort that goes into domestic work, we devalue it anyway, because domestic work has historically been feminized. A 2020 article by history professor Alexandra Findlay in the Washington Post, which discusses women's labor, states, During the 19th century, Americans conceptualized domestic labor as feminine and confined to the private home. This made household labor both vital and invisible to society. And the legacies of this way of thinking remain with us today. This is exactly how it plays out in India. The initial questions directed at a woman on the arranged marriage circuit are if she can cook, if she can clean, and if she can take care of elders and children. This is almost always context agnostic. Whether the conversation is set in rural or urban India, whether the woman is a highly trained and educated working professional or not. Part of the reason this cycle continues is because we've created a self-serving mythology around women as natural caregivers or nurturers. When women extend care work to their families, it is signaled as a mark of love and devotion or supposedly innate qualities and not something that brings income or enables economic activity. A particularly turgid example of this is the way we endlessly eulogize Maa Ke Haat Ka Khana, but don't think of it as work that requires skill or talent. But the truth is, domestic labor is complex and frequently grueling, and women who can afford to often pass it on to other women. When this labor can be quantified and a price put on it, as in the case of domestic workers, it is some of the lowest paying work in the country. It's no different when it comes to the organized sector. An army of Anganwadi and Asha workers, for instance, who undertake the gargantuan but feminized work of large scale child and health care, continue to be overworked and underpaid. And when women are underpaid, as they often are, even in high skill fields, and for the same work as men, it becomes easier to think of their work as less important. But we are all better off knowing the value of our work, whether it is professional, skilled, domestic work, whether we are negotiating salaries or our spaces. And in 2024, the question we should be asking is how do we reimagine work to make it work for women? In Uruguay, the CARE Act guarantees that all children, persons with disabilities and the elderly have the right to access care services. And when care becomes the responsibility of the state, it enables women to get paid jobs. India's solutions will have to take into account our various contexts and existing frameworks. According to the recommendations by the Institute of Social Sciences in New Delhi and the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, expansion of Anganwadis, primary health care, and public distribution of food items can reduce the care burden on women workers. Or it could look like the direct transfer of 1 lakh rupees in the bank accounts of poor women. As Rahul Gandhi and other politicians vow to put a price tag on women's invisible labor, maybe we can start dreaming of a day when this isn't just a seasonal campaign promise. Until then, we'll wait, telling the cost of free labor, one election speech at a time.